you have your Bibles, I hope you do, I'm going to ask you to remain standing, so we'll go right into the Word of God, turn to the book of Galatians, we are in chapter 6, the last chapter of Galatians, we will be actually, this is probably the first time I'm actually preaching the whole chapter today, so hope you brought your lunch, <clears throat> uh, no, actually I will be preaching the whole chapter, but we'll get through it. This is the culmination of a great book, and we'll kind of touch on it a little bit, some of the things from the past uh, few weeks that we've talked about. But here's what it says in Galatians 6. It says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in his neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. It seems contradictory a little bit, but we'll talk about that. Let the one who is taught the, who is, who is taught the word share all good things with the one who who teaches, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that he will also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those who are of the household of faith. See with what large letters I am writing to you and with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that you may, they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the, word, the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor not uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, your, your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we just praise you for your word. We praise you for Paul and his writing in Galatians. Boy, there's a lot here, Father, to unpack. But we know, we know, Father, that you give us the spirit so that we could be people of faith. And while we may struggle, you encourage us with your word. I pray, Father, that we leave today not just be encouraged by today's message, but be encouraged by the word of God in all of Galatians and throughout the whole Bible. And we pray this in your holy name. Amen. Go ahead and have a seat. You know, we talked, we've been talking the last couple weeks about how the church is a messy place, and the reason why it's a messy place is because we are messy people. We all have our issues, we all have our problems. But in the midst of that, as a church community, as believers, fellow brothers and sisters, and believers in Jesus Christ, we are to serve one another in love. And in the process, what that does for us, that makes us fulfill the law. That's what we've talked about over the last two, two weeks. But the question always comes down to, Pastor, what does that look like? What does it look like in a community of people for us to serve one another and in, in the process fulfill the law? Because I'm, I'm not so sure that in the world today, you have very many places where people are serving each other, short of, you know, for a job, if you're a waitress or in a, in a, in a, in a store. But to serve for non-selfish reasons, it doesn't happen very often. So what should it look like in the church? So what we're going to get here in what Paul writes to this church, to the churches in Galatia, in this chapter, 
is we're going to, we're going to get, a, get just a brief snapshot of what it looks like to be a community that serves and loves each other. Now, very briefly, Paul, Paul says that a church community should be burden-bearing. While Paul certainly expected the church to provide for the practical needs, and we do, but we, we, he expects the church to provide for practical needs of its people and for other churches and for missionaries, I, that's not exactly what Paul is referencing here. His main focus is on bearing each other's sins. And the way this occurs in the church is through restoration. Look what it says in verse 1. He says, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. But keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. We see this glimpse of what a, a loving community, what a loving church looks like, a gospel community is one that, that serves each other in love and, and follows the leading of the Holy Spirit. And in order to do this, when we have someone in the church that we know of is sinning, when we know it's a sin, we are to come alongside them. We are to confront them in their sin. Yes. But we're also supposed to come alongside and gently restore them to spiritual wholeness. But we must be careful that we don't get caught up in this sin. I, I would say that unfortunately, this is not something that normally happens. It, it, you know, what, what usually happens in churches is that so you find somebody who's in a sin, and so what do we do? We start chastising them. We start shunning them. We, we, we don't want to be around them. We, we talk about them. We talk about what, oh, did you hear what so-and-so did? That's not loving and Paul, we've talked about that in previous verses, that we can't, we can't gossip, we can't backbite. We, we need to help each other, and we need to walk with each other. I think many times we are too afraid or immature to say something about the sin that we see. Maybe it's because we see the same sin in us. Maybe we're just as guilty as the person we're looking at. I don't know. Could be. I think also that sometimes we're too proud or we're too preoccupied with ourselves to even notice or care what's going on in other people's lives. We put on a good front on Sunday mornings. But I, I would bet if we really got to the core of, if we, every person in here got to the core of what they're dealing with right now, there would be some sin. I'd expect it. There'd also be a lot of pain, a lot of hurt that we need to comfort them and we need to walk with them and restore them to spiritual wholeness. That's the whole plan, the whole goal. But see, we need to bear each other's burdens. But when we do it, we must do it gently. You know, a person, a person who's struggling with something is already hurting. They're already broken. And, and if the Holy Spirit's talking to them, they're going to confess it to you. They're going to admit it. I mean, they're a broken person, so we need to restore them. We need to bring them back to spiritual wholeness. Now, they need to do it. You know, we don't just, we don't just help them get to that point of spiritual wholeness, and then they, you know, they just keep slipping back into it. Sooner or later, you say, you've got to figure this out. I've helped you six times get back to this place. You need to stop this. You make the decision that you want to do this. We bear their burdens gently with the whole goal of being restoration. Careful that we don't fall into the same temptation. What Paul calls this, Paul calls this a very interesting thing. He calls this the way of Christ. Look at verse 2. He says, bear one another's burdens, so fulfill the law of Christ. See, what this means is that since Jesus bore each of our sins on the cross, we too must bear each other's sins. And in doing so, we will, what that does for us, if, if I'm helping somebody, if, if I'm helping somebody walk 
you know, in their spiritual walk to increase and, and to restore them to spiritual wholeness, what I'm going, what's going to do for me is I'm going to realize that I can't be conceited about where I am because believe me, there, but by the grace of God go I. I too could be in that position. Oh, I know. I would never, you know, I would never, I would never be an alcoholic. You never know. You could. I would never be a drug addict. You could. Oh, I would, I would, I would never look at pornography. Well, you probably could. I would never gossip. <laughs> Usually somebody who says that is probably gossiping. But it, when we help somebody, it helps us not be conceited about ourselves. And then we can bear each other's burdens because Jesus Christ came to serve and not be served. And we are supposed to be like him. He gave his life as a ransom for many. So what we see is Jesus is not only, not only is he, by being on the cross, is he bearing our burdens and giving us an example, but in his life, everything he did, he did it for others. Now, I cannot take your sin. I, I cannot, you know, if you've sinned, you can't, Impute it onto me and have me suffer the guilt and the shame. You know, you have to go through that yourself. I'm not Jesus. You're not Jesus. But Jesus does take it. We give it to him. But we, we, but we can walk with each other. And as we're walking with each other, what do we do? We point that person to Christ. And we point that person to God's word. And we point that person to the Holy Spirit. That's what we do. That's how we restore them. But as we're doing this and as we're thinking about this, we must examine ourselves because we must understand that the standard that is set before us is the law of Christ. The law of Christ is that Christ came to serve and not be served. He came to die and bear our sins on the cross. So that is the standard that's set before us. Are we making it? Are we living up to that standard? We don't compare ourselves to other people. I, I can't, in most things, I can't compare myself to Dave when it comes to woodworking. In fact, I would be ashamed to. <laughs> Each of us has gifts that God has given us, and each of us has issues. We can't compare ourselves to each other. We compare ourselves to Christ, and in the process, we don't become conceited because we know how short we fall of that. Because on my own, we've talked about that. On my own, I could never make that standard. So how do I do it? The Holy Spirit comes in and lifts me up and helps me meet that standard because I have Christ's righteousness on me, not mine. But that's the standard. We don't compare ourselves to others. Because what we do is we realize that as we're looking to Christ as the standard, we realize how far we fall short, and we realize that we need to rely on the Holy Spirit more and more and more every day. Look what Paul says to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 4, 1-5. through He says, this is how one should regard us. This is, he's saying, this is how people should look to us. They should see us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Hmm. Oh, no, that's that, that's that church that, that has that, that big stage and the lights and the smoke. That's what people see as that church, that, that pastor who preaches on on you know how, how to really feel good about yourself. I really feel great when I leave there. No, we need to be seen as servants of Christ and keepers of the mysteries of God. This word, his word, is a mystery to the world. They don't understand it. They don't get it. Half the people in the church don't get it. But they're trying. At least they're in the right place to hear it if they're in the right church. And I think that today, as, as time goes on, you're going to see that fewer and fewer churches are going to preach the word. They just are. And I can show you in prophecy, and I can show you what's happening in, this is part of the great apostasy, where we fall away. It happened to the seven churches in Revelation. You see it. It happened to the, with the Gnostics in the first century. It just is. 
And it's coming back around again. But he says, moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. He's saying we need to be good stewards of the mysteries of God, of his word, of his, of his teaching. And we need to be good servants. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. People walk around and say, don't judge me. Oh, no, I don't care whether you judge me or not, because guess what? You don't matter. That's what Paul's saying. I don't even judge myself, he says, for I am not aware of anything against myself. He says, I've done nothing wrong. Don't we all say that? I've done nothing wrong. But here's what he says, but I am not thereby acquitted. acquitted. He says, I, I look at myself and I say, I've done nothing wrong, but guess what? I'm still guilty. Just because I can't see it doesn't mean I didn't, I'm not guilty of it. Because he says, the next, next verse is important. He says, because it is the Lord who judges me. He sees all and knows all. It is God who judges us. He says, therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time. Before the Lord comes, you say, don't judge, don't pronounce judgment. And he doesn't just mean that saying, hey, this person's sinning, I need to tell them their sin. No, that's what we need to do. What he's saying is, don't pronounce judgment on them. Don't pronounce and actually execute that judgment on them. Oh, this is what you're doing. I want nothing more to do with you. I was talking to Sherry this morning. That's what bothers me about our current condition of our society. Well, you, you won't get the vaccine, so I want nothing to do with you. You've gotten the vaccine, so I want nothing to do with you. It doesn't matter. It's both ways. We're not supposed to do that. That'll happen when the Lord comes. He will rightly judge, because he, will, he will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purpose of the heart. That should make us shake in our shoes sometimes. <laughs> He's going to expose our hearts. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. I, I think what Paul's saying is that, you know, we can summarize it by saying that we are, we, we, must, we must bear each other's burdens now because later at the judgment, we will have to bear our own burdens. You will not be held responsible for me. I will not be held responsible for you on that day of judgment. I will be responsible for my stuff and the things I've done wrong. Now, granted, I'm secure in Christ. I have nothing to worry about. It doesn't mean that he won't say, well, you know, I've forgiven you for this stuff. But here's what could have been. See, that's what I think will happen. We'll see what could have been if we had truly followed Christ the way we should have. That's why I think it says that every, every you know, he'll wipe away every tear. I think we will weep to see what we should have been because we're all going to fall short. But then he'll say, well done, good and faithful servant. Or we can put it another way. We serve one another in love because on the day of judgment, we each will be judged according to the law of love. And that's the law of Christ. We will all be judged according to that. Paul goes on and uh, he talks about uh, reaping what we sow in, in verse 6. Um, let me quickly read that. He says, Let the one who is taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked for whatever one sows, that he will also reap. You know, the Apostle Paul was not exactly fond, and you won't find very many places where he talks about money. Usually it's in, in a context of he's collecting money from the churches to take back to Jerusalem because it was a famine. But any time he does talk about money, it's usually in a uh, maybe highly theological or a relational manner. But here, here's the basic guideline that he's giving in verses uh, 6 to 11, I believe it was, was what it is. Yeah, 6 to 11. He's basically saying that pastors are to share with the congregation the spiritual resources of the Word of God. Here, here's, here's what I, I take from that. He says, my, my responsibility as a pastor is to give you the Word of God. If I am not giving you the Word of God, if I'm giving you the Word of Chris and not the Word of God, I will be held accountable for that. I don't want to be held accountable for that. So i got to give you the Word of God. Even if I don't 
like what the Word of God says in there. Sometimes I don't particularly care for what it says. That's okay. I don't have to. I'm just supposed to present it and explain it. But I'm supposed to give you the Word of God so that you may be nourished and equipped to live as Christ lived and to live for Christ. And you, as the believers in Christ, as part of this church, you are to share with the church and with the pastor your financial resources. So that I am free from the burden of having to make a living. I ha I'd have a lot less time to do things if I had to actually, actually had to work outside the church. Now, some churches, that's what they need to do. Some people, that's what they love to do because they like to be in the community. Those are usually the very people who are heavy in evangelism will actually like to work in the world because that gives them opportunity to interact with a lot of non-believers. And they do more work for God there than they can even do in the church. Or you have some churches that are small enough they can't afford a pastor. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But people must be giving freely and joyfully to the work that God is doing. We are to share. And believe me, I too am to share with the church. Part of what I get, and I do. Congregants are to share with the church and with the pastors of financial resources so that pastors are free. But... We need to make sure that we are devoting our time and energy, that the pastor, the church is devoting its time and energy to feeding the flock, to feeding you. We are to share with each other the good things that are received from God for the benefit of each other. That's what we're supposed to do. And I'll be honest with you, we do very well. <laughs> proven in the fact that where we are with benevolence. We are a very giving church, and I appreciate that. I appreciate that I can spend my time studying God's word, preparing to teach, preparing to preach, preparing to worship, and don't have to work an outside job. But that's part of that, part of that relationship we have. We've all been given good things of God, and we need to share them with each other. That's how we do it in love. And this passage is very future-oriented. And, and what Paul is telling us is, is that your actions today matter. They have eternal consequences. Whether we're giving with a cheerful heart to the church or whether we're sowing to please the flesh. Either way, sowing to the Spirit will reap eternal life. Sowing to the flesh will reap corruption and separation from God. We, we must understand that this, this life we live today, it's not the end all of our existence. This is, this is but a blip. This is but a moment when you compare it to eternity that's coming. There is much more to come. And in fact, the best is yet to come. Joel Olstein has a book, Your Best Life Now. And I love the comment that somebody made. I can't even remember who it was. A preacher was preaching and says, you know, if this is your best life now, your next life is going to be really bad. This is not the end all. So a spirit-empowered life can be marked by a generous giving of our time, our treasure, our talents. I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it be tragic? Wouldn't it be extremely tragic to think that generosity comes from trying harder? You know, I'll just try harder to be more generous and be more disciplined when it doesn't. Because the reality is, in order for you to be generous with your time and your talent and your treasures, you have, to, you have to be sacrificial. You have to submit to God, who owns everything anyways. Everything is his. It's all his. And you have to surrender to being led by the Holy Spirit. Being led by him. Walking with him. Wanting to abound in the fruit of the Spirit, which we talked about last week. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We want to abound in those things. And, and see, even though there, there are times that we may feel, I just want to quit. I, I just want to give up. I'm tired. I want to get, I'm tired of fighting the flesh. Wouldn't it, be, wouldn't it be easier just to give into it and let it have its way for a while? I mean, I, I'm just so tired of the temptation and fighting it. We find ourselves in hardships, 
Life is difficult. This life we, are, we live in a fallen world. It's going to get hard. It's not always going to be a bed of roses. I'd settle for a bed of petunias. But even when it is a bed of roses, there are thorns in there. It's going to be hard. And we may find ourselves in a place where financially we don't think we can do it and we, we want to we wanna, you know, decrease our generosity of our times and our talents and our treasures. We must persevere through that. Continue to trust God in that. God is good. If you don't believe that, just listen to what we said about benevolence and wait to hear what we say next week about missions and what we say about how much actual giving we've done this year to the budget. It's amazing what God does through his people when they are faithful. Remember that Jesus, during his entire life, was devoted to sowing the spirit in the world. Not the flesh, but the spirit. I, I, would, I, I, could, I could argue that maybe the one time that his flesh reared itself up was in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's sitting there praying, Lord, take this cup from me. Father, take this cup from me. That's the flesh. But in that next second, he, there was no pause. I don't think he paused at all. He says, but not my will, your will. The Spirit won every time. Because he knew what was coming. But he was sowing the Spirit in the world. He was able to do this, not because, you know, people say, well, he was God. Of course he could do this. No, he was not doing it because he was God. He was doing it because he kept his focus on what was most important. And the most important thing was God's will. Walking in the Spirit. Being led by the Spirit. Look what, it, what, the, what Paul, I think, who is, wrote in Hebrews. Hebrews 12, 2, he says, Looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. The sacrifices we make in life sometimes might seem small. Even insignificant at times. Those little things we do for people that, you know, they never noticed. I'll be honest with you. The simple thing as letting somebody in front of you from an on-road when there's a lot of traffic. Now, I struggle with that because I, <laughs> I want to get to where I'm going, so I don't like to let people in. But I do it sometimes, and I know it made that person's life a little bit easier. Those little things that, that we don't think are any important at all. But in the end, at the day of the Lord, they will be important. Because if we do those things, that's who we are and that's how we live. In the book of Colossians, Paul writes, If you then, if you then have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set you mi your mind on the things that are above, not the things that are on the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. He says, don't worry about the things in this world. It doesn't mean you don't have to deal with them. You know, I, didn't, I can't just ignore my finances. I can't just ignore my troubles. What he is saying is, don't worry about them. Don't set your mind on those things. Don't just focus on those things. Focus on the things of Christ and where God is and what we have coming, the new, the new life, the new creation that's coming we're going to talk about in a few minutes. That's what we need to be focusing on. See, Paul, what Paul wants us to do, he wants us to boast in the cross. He talks about that in verses 11 through 18. He says, see with, with large, what large letters I'm writing with my own hand? I can just see him like great in these big letters for emphasis, probably capitalizing everything. He's stressing this point that the, the Judaizers are troubling these churches only because they're more concerned about their own interest than the interest of God and the interest of the people. They wanted the Galatians to be circumcised so that they would look good for their fellow Jews. The, the Judaizers were probably being, because they were, they were in the church, they were probably being chastised by their fellow Jews because they're still going to synagogue and still going to the temple. They're being criticized. Well, you hang around with those Christians, don't you? 
Don't you think about, oh yeah, yeah, there's some friends of mine. Well, they're not circumcised. So what the Judaizers are saying, well, if they would just get circumcised, then, you know, things would be better. I would look better. It's for selfish motives. But Paul says, man, they're not even keeping the law. And in fact, they're trying to save their own necks instead of losing them for the sake of Christ in service to others. See, what they're doing is they're doing what a lot of people do today. They're using the cross as a get-out-of-jail-free card. Well, I believe in Jesus. Don't ask me to sacrifice anything, but I believe in Jesus. That's all it takes, right? Well, if you truly believe in Jesus, what does it say? It says, you will confess, if you believe in your heart and confess to you with your mouth that Jesus is real, Jesus is God. No, Jesus is Lord. Now, we, we kind of kind of lose that because we don't understand what that means. What that means is Jesus is Lord over your whole life. He is in charge of all of it. He is your main focus. You can't use him as a get-out-of-jail-free card because you'll find yourself not getting out of jail free. You can't just use it when it's convenient. And this is why it says the cross, see, the way to the cross is a narrow road. And that road is paved with the good things. It's for the good of others that that road is there. We're to be serving each other. And this happens today in the church when the cross becomes a, a symbol that we display instead of a reality that we embrace. So I says, take up your cross daily and follow Christ. That means you are to live a sacrificial life. Oh, pastor, I just so get sit so tired of sacrificing. Yeah, I'm sure you do. So you need to pray for more strength and keep going. Because you can bet there are other people sacrificing for you too. And if we're sacrificing for each other all the time, man, wouldn't that be awesome? I think the legal protection and the, the social acceptance that we enjoy here in the West sometimes makes it easy to display the cross, but very difficult to live it. Because we get comfortable in our ease. Because we live in this world that's extremely deadly. We live in a deadly world. Do you, do you know the mortality rate of this world is 100%? There have only been two people who've left this world without dying. Enoch and Elijah. That's it. Everybody else has died, including our Savior. But you want to know something even more astounding, if you really think about it, is that the cross... The cross is even more deadly. It's lethal to this world. It is lethal. God took a tool of punishment created by a sinful world, created by the Persians, actually, who created it, and turned it back upon its own creators. But this wasn't done by a God who's vindictive. God wasn't being vindictive when he did this. It was done in love. Because it is through the cross that God gave the death blow to the world. It is because of the cross of Christ that the world is going to end. It had to happen. But because of his love for us, he wanted us not to go with the world. So he died for us. One day this earth will breathe its last. I think it's closer than we think. But this whole death blow to the world, it wasn't done by religious jihad. It was done by crucifying the sinful nature of man. And in doing so, God made a way for the Spirit to live in each one of us. And this is how Paul puts it in Romans. He says, but if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, the Spirit is life because of righteousness. It's interesting. It doesn't say the spirit is alive. It says the spirit is life. It's active. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, you who raised, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Our bodies are dead, full of sin. The Holy Spirit brings us back to life. 
So then, brothers, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. That doesn't mean just physically die. That means eternal separation from God, spiritual death. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. So what this means is that the world is crucified to us. It's dead. And we are crucified to the world, as Paul says. As believers, this has already happened for us. Though we continue to put to death the flesh that still remains in us. So Paul, remember I said Paul was talking about a new creation. So the, the reality is that death is not the goal. Death was not the goal of the cross. But life. Because the crucifixion was followed by the resurrection. When God sent his son to the world, Jesus to die on the cross, he made him rise on the third day. And when that happened, a hole was blown in the worldly system, large enough to make way for a new creation. And Jesus' own bodily presence, raised, transformed, glorified, is the inbreaking of the new creation. Revelation 3.14 says, And the angel of the, God, of the church in Laodicea write, these are the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Jesus was the beginning of the new creation. And then Jesus makes this promise in Revelation 21, 5. He says, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for the words are trustworthy and true. And the, but see, how do we see Jesus doing this? How do we see Jesus making all things new? What we do is we see it in the life of, that the Holy Spirit is bringing into us and the life in the community of the church. How's he doing making all things new? By the benevolence giving that was given and the benevolence that we, and the people we've helped. That's how he's making all things new. By the missionaries we support, by the ministries we support in this church. God, the Holy Spirit is recreating humanity in God's image and likeness, infusing our souls with his very presence. And he adorns us with his character. And that's why Paul says the new creation is the only thing that matters. And he tells them in verse 16, he says, peace and mercy and as children of God. We get the privilege of experiencing this new creation in our lives. But we also get the responsibility of embodying this new creation in our lives together. We become part of the new creation. It's this already but not yet. We'll, we'll see it come to fulfillment when Christ comes back, but we can have a part of it now when we serve and we love each other. We, the church, are the vanguard of the new creation. Our job is to point the world to Christ. Our job is to point each other to Christ in the Holy Spirit and point us, each other to that day that one day will be fully accomplished, that peace and mercy that was found in Jesus Christ, in Christ alone. Now, Paul continues to talk about the marks he shows on his body. He says, he, he says that he, he bears the marks of Christ. And, and Paul definitely suffered greatly for the cross of Christ. Remember, if you remember back at the beginning, we talked about possibly the reason why Paul was here was because he had been beaten in one of the towns, and he couldn't go very far, so he ended up, he hadn't planned on going to the churches in Galatia, but he, or stopping there and starting, starting churches, but he did it. And he started these churches while the people were taking care of him. He spread the gospel, but he has suffered greatly. He has, bears the marks of the body. I'm sure his body showed scars from when he was beaten, when he was stoned. But see, our life, our life is to be sacrificial. It may at times be painful. We've been sheltered in this country. We've been blessed in reality. And I think at the same time, sometimes a little cursed because I think we're a little soft. Are we ready? Could we really suffer for the cross of Christ? Yeah, I guess I'll give up my latte every Monday morning. No, that's not what they're talking about. I'm talking about beatings. Are we ready? If our lives are not difficult or haven't been difficult, let's put it this way, haven't been difficult at all. It's probably because it wasn't a Christian life. 
Because even if people don't persecute you, you've got a, all the spiritual forces in the heavenly realms who are against you if you're a believer in Christ. And they can't affect you. They can't possess you, but they can't affect you. Or at least our lives may not be cross-shaped and not patterned after the life of Christ. Because normally, what do we want to do? We want to avoid suffering, don't we? Anybody here want to be suffering? Nobody wants to suffer. We want to avoid it. But that's not the way of a spirit-led follower of Christ. We don't avoid suffering. We take it head on. We meet it head on. We, we deal with it. We endure it. And hopefully, others come alongside us and walk with us in it. You know, people sometimes today will say, yeah, well, you know, my mother-in-law, that's my cross to bear. That's not what he's talking about. Paul's not talking about a cross that is just my cranky mother-in-law, my lousy golf swing, or my overbearing boss. I mean, those are personal disappointments. Those are not the marks of Christ. What, the, what is the marks of Christ are personal sufferings, actual sufferings for believing and proclaiming Christ. But within that, we have grace. And Paul says, grace is the very reason for this letter. If you remember back to chapter one, it began with grace. And now it ends with grace. But this grace is costly. And this grace should compel us to walk Continue to walk in the Holy Spirit, living the gospel in our daily lives and, and prompting us to boast in the cross of Christ and Christ alone. Let's pray. Thank you for joining Living Faith on our YouTube channel. My prayer is that this message today has encouraged you and strengthened your faith in Jesus Christ. We would love to connect with you, so please subscribe to our channel and hit the bell so that you get updated when we add a new message. Also, please leave any comments you might have in the comments section. We would love you to join us live for our service on Sunday mornings at 10 o'clock. We hope you have a great day today. God bless.